Good morning on the West Coast and good afternoon on the East Coast. Today is Wednesday, April 20th, and as I always say, it's a beautiful day to have a webinar. I'm John Yarrington, CEO of the Performance Driven Marketing Institute, a 501c6 not-for-profit trade association dedicated to protecting, promoting, and advancing the direct-to-consumer and direct response advertising industries. And on behalf of the entire PDMI team, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the PDMI seasonal webinar series. As a reminder, the seasonal webinar series is an in-depth discussion led by industry experts on today's hottest topics. Today's webinar is brought to you by the PDMI's Workshop Council, and it includes a group of experts working in the cannabis and CBD marketplace. These experts will be sharing the latest trends and news when it comes to sales and marketing in this rapidly growing space. However, before we get started, please allow me to do a little housekeeping. If you'd like to ask a question and we encourage you to do so, please use the questions tab located in your control panel. Please also know you're welcome to ask questions throughout today's conversation, but we'll hold all replies to the end of today's discussion. And finally, if you'd like to learn more about the PDMI and how you can become an active member, please download the membership brochure located in the handouts tab in your control panel. Alrighty, folks, with that said, it's my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, She'll be playing the role of both Cheech Marin and Tommy Chong in PDMI's version of Up in Smoke. She's an incredibly talented and love, always lovely Lori Zeller. Lori is a senior executive at Thor Associates with a passion in pro for project management and product development. She takes great pride in being a behind the scenes traditional and digital geek, ensuring the sustainability of Thor Associates and Thor client roster. She's also a proud member of the PDMI Workshop Council. Lori, it's a pleasure to have you here with us today. Thank you so much and take it away, my friend. Oh, thank you so much, John. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining this PDMI webinar. Of course, as John said, my name is Lori Zeller. As you may know, I am the managing partner of Thor Associates. We're a strategic marketing agency tasked with delivering transactional revenue, either by having consumers call an 800 number or order a product or service online. Thor provides the intersection where linear and digital marketing coexist. We work on our clients' behalves to drive sales, provide leads, and data analytic insights with transparency, working with a commitment to the nature of a true partnership. It's such a pleasure to be here. I want to thank the panelists who have joined us and are going to share their incredible insights regarding the challenges and opportunities of cannabis CBD marketing in what some are referring to, and I agree, as the wild, wild west. Uh, first, I just want to say to you that Jack Ferry is having a little technical di difficulty. So first, Anthony Sully Sullivan is going to talk about himself and a little background and how he got into this space. Then Anthony's going to say, take it away, Jack. And when Jack is done, he's going to say, take it away, Bill. And then I'll jump back in. Sully? Sounds great, Laurie. Well, thanks for having me, everyone. Jack, Bill, thanks for being panelists and wherever you are, I uh, appreciate you being here. Um, my name is Anthony Sullivan, AKA Sully, AKA the OxyClean guy. Um, that's probably how you know me. And I'm also the CEO and founder of Mont Kush, that is a high CBD organic hemp company located out of Plainfield, Vermont. Um, I'm not going to spend too long talking about how I got into the CBD space, but I obviously have a 25, 30 year background in direct response television marketing. I have a little girl who's now 11. Her name is Devon, and she was on a anti-seizure medication um, and she t had terrible side effects from the medication. And in 2018, I, I got open, my eyes got open to the benefits of CBD and hemp. Um, I was a I was a late adopter, if you will, when you think about how how cannabis and CBD has started to permeate and become more mainstream. I didn't really put two and two together of the medicinal benefits of CBD and the recreational benefits. Um, my my little girl's mom is a PhD in school psychology, and she was the one that suggested it. Anyway, we we over time we switched her regimen from the pharmaceutical anti seizure medication. I don't really want to share the name of the medication because a lot of people benefit from it. But my little girl struggled. We we moved her to a regimen of CBD. Uh, her seizures literally vanished, and I watched her personality return. Uh, she had lost 20% of her body weight, and um, and that her body weight returned. And I basically got my little girl back from this amazing hemp plant. 
Um, I think there's a big difference between um, cannabis uh, that's above 0.3% THC and what we use to make CBD. I was so inspired that I decided to start Mont Kush. Um, and that, that's why I'm in the business. I, um, I'm, it's been three years. We have a, a, a great brand. We are growing. It's difficult, but it's been worth it. So um, that's who I am, and that's why I'm in the business. Jack, over to you. Hey, thanks, Sully. I'm Jack Ferry. I'm an associate at Baker Hostetler uh, out of our DC office. And basically after the, uh, and I'm an advertising lawyer uh, most of the time, but, and, and that's kind of gone into the CBD side of things because after the farm bill passed in 2018, the very end, we had a lot of clients come to us asking, you know, okay, CBD, it's, it's the hot, Thing right now what can we do to advertise to sell it and then you know we had to figure that out and so we looked at the, the federal law and the uh, the state laws and have kept track of those as they've gone on as well as the fda regulation and now increased regulation at the state level and we've just been you know keeping track of all of the developments as as it's really rapidly you know become legalized you know at the federal level in the states and now moving into regulation um which has its pluses and minuses, and I think we'll get into those a little bit more um, as part of this webinar. Um, and for for some more knowledge on some of those the pluses and minuses of the regulatory state, I'll I'll pass it over to Bill. Thank you, um, Bill Rieta. I'm a, almost a, nearly a 20 year veteran of uh, Cardinal present uh, high risk processing solutions for. Uh, for the industry that's gone through uh, fits and starts, uh, I like to uh, center my expertise and, and capabilities around uh, difficult processing situations, right? Cannabis is just another vertical that has that. Uh, passionate about payments, so that carries into the vertical nicely. And uh, they it's a, about a 10-year-old industry, and uh, they need a lot of help. Um, I believe that if you're taking a payment, you should take a legal payment, right, first and foremost. And uh, you should get to keep your money, as much of it as you possibly can, um, and we can provide good services to people. Um, the way the laws and rules and regulations are changing very, very quickly in this space um, has caused me to take a, uh, a totally different look at the product sets and everything for my company and what we do today uh, to make sure that you know we can guarantee uh, good future success for the guys that are in uh, both CBD, Delta 8, Delta 9, Delta 10, um, and THC spaces. So. Um, so that's what you're getting from me. Um, give you some real world situations. Turn it back over to you, Lori. Thank you so much. So before we start, I'm going to share some fun facts. I mean, every webinar should have a fun fact. And what I'd like to share is that you may be curious, who is the consumer? Who is the customer that buys CBD and cannabis? And we went into and found that the demographic is really twofold. There are 18 to 30 year olds who mostly use cannabis CBD for recreational use. And then there's the 30 to 60 year olds who we refer to as the pharma-centric consumer, consumer, and they're using it mostly for pain relief. And what I found interesting, and I hope you will as well, is that the pain relief versus the recreational the pain relief consumer, there's two times the size of the recreational. And this is mostly because the age demographic, uh, these people have more disposable income and they're looking to solve their pain issues. So now that we know who's buying, let's talk about how to get them to buy it. So Sully, these first questions are really for you. And then I'm going to ask Bill and I'm going to ask Jack a couple other things in the, on the back end of it. So first, what I think would be really great to know is which is the key consumer channel to advertise CBD? Meaning that we know the web is the optimal channel today, but do you see omni-channel happening in the near future? I, uh, it's been a, um, a marketing conundrum unlike anything I've ever experienced. Um, I, will, I will require it to, I'm gonna oxyclean really quick. I know very, you know, we know how to sell laundry detergent. It's ubiquitous, everybody needs it, people know their brands. All of a sudden, they get into this space. People don't know if they need it. They don't know their brands, and they're very, very uneducated. And I say that in a way where they're not, you know, they, there's a not there's you go on the on the internet and it's you Google it and you get one of a, a million answers and you get put down a bunch of different rabbit holes. 
we, you know, I will tell you right now, Mont Cush, we had a, we have a farm up in Vermont and I, I actually went for the, the big kahuna and I thought I'm going to get this on television. I'm going to be the first person to advertise CBD on television. I know I can't do an infomercial in any meaningful way. I know I can't do a two minute spot or a 60 second traditional direct response spot. I know that I didn't know at the time, but Facebook uh, limits our advertising capability. Of course, that goes hand in hand with Instagram. TikTok is, is its own animal altogether. Google Analytics makes it extremely difficult for us to advertise. So I thought I would shoot a TV show with the legendary uh, producer, Tom Beers, who produced Deadliest Catch, and we would kind of get around the advertising laws by making a TV show out of it. Um, that in itself proved extremely challenging because we even got pushback from networks that wouldn't air a TV show about our brand. So we have had a really, really, really difficult time advertising CBD. Um, you put those three letters together and you just get pushed back and knocked down. Now, with enough money and knowing the right people, there are workarounds to all of these channels. And I see I see people making headway on Facebook. I see people making headway on Instagram, on social media in general. I, the TV barrier to entry is coming down a little bit. I mean, ultimately, this is a product that's federally legal, right? We should be able to advertise it anywhere. But due to people being afraid, networks worried about exposure, Google's worried about exposure on a federal level, payment processing that Bill will talk about, it's just not as easy as, as, it, it, as it could be. And I think the biggest hurdle for me, which is why I'm still in it, because if this was another product, I probably would have punted um, and said, you know what, we'll move on to the next project. But I still believe, and I'm going on a little bit long here, that the average person, the person you're talking about, still couldn't tell you a CBD or a cannabis brand. If you went to Betsy in Omaha, and I say this to the, the greatest respect to Betsy in Omaha, and you said, tell me a, na a brand of cannabis, tell me a brand of CBD, they do not know. There is, there is no, there, then I know their brands because I'm in the business and the people watching this webinar probably know the brands because they're in the business. It, the, the nut has still got to be cracked and it's going to come through advertising and it's going to come as these channels open up. And I hope they open up, they should open up, um it's about time they opened up so with that um, i'll pass it along so, so Sully, then what digital tactics are you using what how how are you advertising i don't want to disclose all my oh, i don't want to disclose everything to my competition but email is is the best platform that we have right now getting hold of that customer directly and a I database. she's in pain and i say she actually but we are we finding that our, our customer skews female she actually skews um, 45 plus, which is interesting. And you know, we we thought it was pain and anxiety. I mean, sorry, anxiety and sleep. Because when I, you know, when you go into this space, it's it's anxiety, it's sleep, a bit of pain is is there. Right. So I'm happy to hear that you have that research that pain is number one because we have found that that pain and even then with the FDA and the FTC, we have to be careful about what we can and can't say around the word pain. So we are walking that tight line between claims and i've done this before i mean it's so funny when you said wild west because this reminds me of the infomercial space in the 80s it was the wild west you speak to greg renker or, or, or bill guffey or some of the old the guys say old but they are old now they'll <laughs> you know become regulated right and and you could say whatever you want and with it came regulation and now you have these great companies like you know guffey ranker that's turned into the proactive company so i think we're in that space with this it's a marathon not a sprint and you know the fact we're doing this on 420 is i understand why we're doing it on 420 but it's a problem really that we still the medicinal use of cannabis and cbd is still mixed in with this oh i'm gonna go and have a toke if you want to go and have a toke and get high it's a separate and i'm great and i all the people that came before me but i did this for my little girl and there's a wellness component to this that is legitimate and we have to the two they're never going to be separated right. because there's a recreational and a wellness component wellness. to this one, but they're two different uses. Speak to a cancer survivor, they're gonna use it for their nausea, you know, and it makes them feel good at the same time. So how that gets navigated is anyone, anyone that I don't know. So Sully, let's take it outside of that realm. 
talk to me about affiliate marketing, not not inside your company, but what are your thoughts in terms of all the <clears throat> affiliate marketers out there? Is there an opportunity for them to start aligning themselves with companies and start selling these products? I take my glasses off here because affiliate marketing is actually the, the it's the number one source of revenue for the CBD business. And it's also the number one area where you can make any claims you want. And all of a sudden you've got, you know, Kim Kardashian, you've got uh, uh, Ronaldo, um, who's the one I just read about? Russell Brand is attached to a CBD brand through an affiliate marketing campaign that he's got nothing to do with. And it's a nightmare for Russell Brand. It's bad for the consumer because the consumer says, I'm gonna buy something that Russell Brand, who, who is attached to. So the affiliate marketing space, while it's extremely good and, and can be extremely profitable, is also, it's a petri dish for people making false claims and giving consumers a really, really bad experience. So we are in the affiliate space. We pick our affiliate partners really, really carefully and vet them because I'm attached to it and I don't want any of our customers to have a bad experience. And, you know, the affiliate marketing space um, is its own, uh, and, you know, it's a living, breathing organism all by itself. But yeah, there are lots of opportunities in the affiliate space. And I would just, uh, you know, I would just ask for, you know, be compliant, don't make claims you can't right. substantiate and make sure your customer, you ship, don't put them into a, a subscription program that they're gonna hate. And then there's five layers of websites to get back to, you know, they can't cancel their subscription. It opens up that whole, that whole can of worms exactly. that is terrible for the business if it's not done right. So I, I, like, affil I like affiliate marketing and I don't like it. I got uh, it. my ears, Sully. Your, your lawyers must love you with that, with that attitude. That's... <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna thank you, Sully, because you always end what you say and you open <clears throat> up the opportunity for my next question. So let's go into the challenges and barriers to entry on how to run a business with, with CBD cannabis. Bill, I'd like you to please, if you would, discuss the challenges with payment processing in the cannabis CBD world. And then and then also while you're there, so I don't have to ask two questions, talk a little bit about underwriting. What differs between cannabis and CBD? Mm, I could write a book on that. I'll keep it as short as I can. Thank you, Laurie. Okay. Um, and, and, and Anthony, thanks for bringing up uh, Guffy and Renker, two of my old good customers, right? Back in the day. <laughs> so it uh, takes me back. <laughs> yeah. So uh, challenges. Uh, the challenges stem from the legalization, uh, the federal legalization of marijuana overall, right? We're going to get into some of those points as, as this discussion goes forward. But since we don't have federal legalization, we have state legalization. And we have different states legalized um, for different substances. Some are medical, um, uh, some are general consumption. Um, all 50 states are legal now for CBD, right, which is derived from the hemp plant. So we've had to become a, a bit of a student of the game, if you will, Lori. Um, in order to explain these types of programs or systems that we utilize to process the actual payments, right? And a lot of people in this space believe they can only take cash. The answer is no, that's not true, right? We have legal systems with real banks behind them, not credit unions, right? That can process payments with pin debit, right? On a terminal, if they are a walk-in type of business, or maybe they might be a, a seed farm or uh, they might grow fertilizer. Maybe they don't touch the plant, but the you know the fertilizer is, is utilized um, to grow the plant. Um, banks can touch you about that. So we've worked very hard with our acquiring banks um, and our partners in this space. Um, we have two viable systems that a lot of lawyers have had, tried to poke holes in, and they've been unsuccessful. Um, so one awesome. of them is ACH, and one of them is Pin Debit, right? Um, so those two systems work. Um, those banks are following the rules and regulations. Um, and that is tough for the bank because those are changing very, very fast, right? Um, and a bank doesn't do anything by chance. Otherwise, it's money laundering. So they're careful. And we have to be very quick to be careful with them um, or we'll lose their faith in the ability to process these types of payments. It's not costing a whole hell of a lot of money. Um, it, it's a slightly more than what a traditional direct marketer would pay, um, say, in the MLM space or even on TV. Uh, so... You know, the costs are coming down uh, because we're pretty efficient at it. Um, and, and that's been a positive influence of what's happened. Um, the underwriting piece um, has, we've, <laughs> we've had to train our own underwriters, train our own salespeople um, because they're dispensing advice to a crowd of people that have received a bunch of bad advice, right? The buyers of these types of programs 
the dispensary owners or the direct marketers. Um, and maybe they got into a bad situation and they used a system that was illegal and then their money got seized, right, to pay fines. Because like it or not, you can't run a, a transaction down a traditional payment rail for Visa and MasterCard like we could for Oxy, right, or Proactive. We can't do it, right? We have to use alternative payment rails that are perfectly legit and legal, right, but they're not owned by the big monster public entities Visa and MasterCard. So that's how we do, you know, that, that you know, they're looking for secret sauce and I've answered a ton of those questions um, to a lot of people even today at the conference that I'm at. Um, and they're like, wow, they're amazed, right? Now I've been speaking for these people for three years, right? Um, and been at this conference five times all over America. Um, so it's not new, um, but you know, the sophistication part is uh, getting greater and greater on the underwriting side because the companies are maturing a little bit. So now we're having to ask more questions. Um, there are different types of cannabis products, Delta 8, Delta 9, Delta 10, right? CBD, uh, Sally mentioned it has to be under 0.3% uh, to be classified exactly. as CBD. So now, you know, we go back to the, uh, the merchant and we say, okay, you have to prove as such, right? With certificates of authenticity. And those have to be tested every three months. Every 90 days, we have to have a new test. That's a compliancy rule in some states. We got to keep that on file. So there's extra handling that you know our underwriters go through in order to take these types of merchants on, because obviously we're audited, we're audited, the banks are audited, right? So and they're looking for those types of things, right? Now two years ago they weren't looking for them because they didn't know what to ask, right? Um, in the last you know about year we've gotten uh, smarter and you know a little bit quicker. Uh, on how to lead the witness, so to speak, on the merchant side. And that's been paying off. Awesome. Perfect. And to that vein, Jack, let's talk about fulfillment. I know that you and I have had an offline conversation. I'd like you to share with everybody, if you could, in, in a short amount of time, the different rules regarding ingestibles uh, versus topical cannabis and CBD, and also just a broad overview of the risks and regulations. Yeah, and I think what what both Sully and Bill have talked about. Um, sorry, that's too informal calling you Sully, Anthony. The uh, that the you know where we are now is so different than where we were two years ago. The end of uh, or you know you know basically the end of 2018, the farm bill passed, and then it was it really was the wild wild west. It was it's legal at the federal level. We think we can do everything, but then suddenly there's all this pushback from from banks, maybe for payment processing from Facebook and networks for advertising and you know the kind of then leveled out people figured out what they could do and then inroads have been made in those areas as Bill has been discussing as Sully has discussed there's suddenly you know it's there there was still fear in kind of those traditional players and it's taken time to get to accustomed to the idea that it has been legalized there hasn't been you know a ton of crazy enforcement action but but what happened is it was made for legal at a federal level but as as Bill touched on, it was still illegal at some state levels, CBD, because it fell under the definition of cannabis. Um, and cannabis was, you know, a prohibited drug generally in some states. And so what's happened now is that, you know, up to 0.3% THC uh, hemp derived uh, CBD is legal at the federal level and now pretty much in all the states. And uh, so we're kind of moving on from that broad legalization to the regulation of it. And this is, you know, where where things in some ways get even trickier because, you know, that was a big push and it's really impressive that it happened so quickly to, to legalize, um, you know, across across the country. But now we have to deal with different regulations in different states and what the federal government is saying. And for example, a big one, like Lori said, is that the the FDA still prohibits uh, adding CBD to food or dietary supplements. So, you know, people who want to put it in um, you know, drinks or food as a coffee shop around the corner from me did actually. You uh, you can't do that under the FDA's, uh, you know, uh, and be legal according to the FDA. Now, a lot of states are kind of running against that as we've seen with weed, you know, the California uh, actually has a whole regulatory apparatus for adding CBD to food. And so there is kind of, you know, there's differences emerging at the state level and increased regulation there. But that FDA prohibition um, does remain a, a big, a big federal hurdle to CBD. And I'll, I'll cut myself off there, Lori, because 
we could talk okay. about that more and talk I about it. You can. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Um, Bill, I know you and I, in terms of fulfillment and really about direct marketing rules, and, and maybe Sally has something to say, but we talked about the fact that clear terms and conditions, customer service, this still applies. It doesn't matter that it's regulated and that CBD and cannabis is a little bit different from each other. There are still the same. We have to fall back on direct marketing rules as, as direct marketers, correct? Uh, we do, actually. Uh, that's a really good point. Um, some of the some of the stuff that uh, we learned and trained up on uh, 10, 15 years ago for the direct marketers uh, as sold on TV, that applies right to this marketplace, 100%, right? Some of the first things we look for, we won't even send it into underwriting, right? If it doesn't have a clear return policy, right? Um, and uh, a customer service number that's very visible, right? Um, do they have their posted COAs online, right? Um, and those are the certificates showing where it came from, where it was grown, all the kind of stuff that a prudent buyer should be looking for. It doesn't matter that they may not click on it. It has to be there, right? Um, that's exactly. what our, you know, that's what we're looking for um, to make sure that they're a credible um, and, and a viable merchant, right? Because um, if we're not, if we're not policing that, <laughs> what are we doing, right? Um, and then we have to help them understand where to sell. Even though CBD is legal in all 50 states, you can't ship it to all 50 states, right? And Correct. some of those states come on and off so we have to be paying attention um where thc is concerned some states have rules you know for example they want the person's image their id that we have to check to go right along with the transaction id you know, information which is hard to do in payments so we've had to develop some new technologies to actually allow that to happen um, geolocation comes into play because you can't sell it over state lines if it's thc based right um, this is all about tax revenue for the state. Um, so we got to make sure that, you know, they're taking care of their individual states if they're located on a border area, right? Um, and age verification, you know, we need that. Um, just like in liquor and wine and everything else, um, cannabis has an age limit, so it's a controlled substance. Got it. And, and Tilly, I'm going to ask you something really now that we, we're talking about legal certifications and state requirements. Is, is there an example you can share? And if you can't, just, you know, tell me you can't that that you can help our audience understand really how specific the process is or maybe discuss a legal challenge that no, don't tell us what you had to do to overcome it, but that you overcame, which brought Mont Cush back into the fold and were, you know, now you're able to do what you have to do. I I'll, I'll may say something a little controversial here, but I want to I want to address the the cannabis CBD space from very from 30,000 feet. It's no secret that the country's had an opioid epidemic, and this country and I love the United States, but the 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 way this happened that you could be a skateboarder, perfectly healthy skateboarder, a snowboarder, a, a fall off a ladder painting a house, and you could go to the emergency room and your doctor would prescribe you opioids. And you could legally get opioids that has, has put a whole generation of people into a terrible, terrible situation. And it's all okay legally, even though it isn't, you know, it was all kind of paid for by big lobbying, right? Because it was oh, at the time. And now we see the fallout of these terrible ideas. Let's just hand out opioids like it's candy. And now you've got people living in cardboard boxes under bridges shooting up heroin. Um, and that, that, is the, that is the bottom of, of that scale. The fact that we've had such a battle with cannabis and CBD that doesn't have anything like the negative effects of something like the opioid epidemic and the fact that the, the, the legality of it and the difficulty of it of, of processing and growing and the fact that we have to have the COAs on the bottles, which we do. If you buy a bottle of Mont Cush, one of the things I'm really proud of that we did at Mont Cush, I actually went and bought a farm. So I and we bought and in 2019 we bought 66,000 seeds and we planted them ourselves in the ground and we watched these plants in 90 days they they grow in the ground in mid May and we watched them go from little seedlings like this big to six feet high and then you cut the colas off the top and whichever extraction method you use but when you look at the actual the, the benefits of this plant whether you're in the CBD space or cannabis space. It, it, it's clear that you know the the amount of regulatory hurdles that are involved with this. It, it's it's almost it's ridiculous when you look at what you can get out there when you when you compare this to to opiates. So I mean we've had um, we've had battles everywhere and there's sometimes I just want to go what what is the big deal here? 
you know, ultimately, I think that the government wanted to turn this into a taxable event, right? They wanted to tax it. And I think they've done it. I, I think, you know, I know New Jersey just went recreational this week or, or last week. They, they have yeah. turned it into a, uh, a legal product you can now buy for medicinal or recreational use. And it's going, I think it's going to go 50 states. In, 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 10 years from now, this conversation, there may be one state holding out. But, um, you know, and the, the price of cannabis I read this morning is down to seven hundred dollars a pound, which, you know, is is so, so below what it used to be when it was all black market. Um, but we're still fighting, you know, all these battles like it's, um, it, you know, I mean, you can take a bottle of our CBDA, which is about as close to Mother Nature as possible. And a little relentless plug here for Mont Kush. But we have a USDA organic certification and um, we sell it to, you know, to to grandmas who want to deal with their pain and it's it's a it's an oil that comes from a plant and it's all natural and it, it does solve a problem for these people and we're still fighting these regulatory hurdles where we can't even run an ad on on a on a mainstream thing so we we just continue to slowly look at places where we can advertise um the the labeling requirements the the traceability with the coas is a big deal the claims we can and can't make um, it, it, it is challenging, but like I said before, I kind of go back to, um, I, I do see doors opening. I do see this coming. It's coming more and more mainstream every day. It's just taking a little bit longer. And I think it's because people are afraid. They, they are afraid of it. I mean, there are some people that have called hemp and you could eat a whole entire field and not get high. It's the devil's plant. And there's still this stigma, it's the devil's plant. And, and if it's the devil's plant, then you're sure as hell not going to be able to use Visa or MasterCard to pay for it. Um, and it's, uh, but, you know, in this challenge, this, this kind of, if you want to call it like startup chaos of this, there's, there's a lot of opportunity. And I think there's a lot of people who, who won't make it, who will fall for, you know, for like lack of funds or just, you know, they get tired or they'll get bored up. But I think, like the internet in the early days, you know, there was a lot of startups, right? There was a lot. And then, you know, now you got the big, the big players, but we, you know, we can't even sell on Amazon, the biggest retailer in the world. We can't get in Walmart because Walmart won't take it because they're afraid of liability. Now I can put hemp oil on Amazon, but I don't want to, because we're not hemp oil. I want to put what we have our active and we, we can't go on Amazon, but we will, we keep knocking on the door. Not, not yet. Right. So not yet. Not yet. And, and I think, and it, it's and going I think that, it'll happen. It's going I, think that you're right. I, I just think we have to hang in there. And I'm happy to be in it because I'd like people to see me and see my daughter, my little girl who's 11. And if you go to our website and you see what it's done for her, you can see that it is life changing for a lot of people. And it should not be this difficult. But Correct. It is. Correct. That, that being said, we're going to switch over. Um, down to the idea of online reviews. What I want to talk about, is I want to talk about class action suits, claims, competition, because Sully brings up a great point, which is why is it so difficult on the one hand and why is the government stepping in? And on the other side, what are what is the consumer, what is the American, in America, we're talking about our country, what is America doing and, and what are our, our companies doing competitive lead to each other. So Jack, you and I had a, a small conversation. I think it would be great if you would share. Share with us the online reviews being the area of focus for the FTC and that there are not specific requirements for CBD merchants. Can you elaborate on that for us? Yeah, you know, and, and looking at these areas, like, uh, let me make sure I'm not muted here. No, I'm not. Okay, great. Two years into the pandemic, you think I'd have it down, but, but still I'm not on video and making sure I'm not muted. But uh you know, like Sully said, there is, you know, there, there's still a stigma with C CBD, you know, because it's associated with cannabis, but, well, you know, it's from cannabis. And, uh, you know, there's so as a result, there might be more intense scrutiny from regulatory actors, class action plaintiffs and the like uh, might be more of a target. And so there aren't, you know, when you look at something like online reviews, it's not uh, that there are special requirements to CBD. But when you're when you're dealing with something that's kind of a high risk area, like Bill said, you, you want to make sure you're compliant across the board uh, with all legal requirements just because there's a bigger target on your back. And, what, you know, for online reviews, it has been an area of uh, focus for the CB, sorry, for the, for the FTC in the last couple of years. We've had some FTC investigations that we've handled, you know, specifically focused on that area. And, you know, there's just a couple things to keep in mind. You you know that there's been cases on writing your own reviews obviously that's something you shouldn't do um, but then the big one that kind of people might not 
find so self-obvious is that if you're incentivizing a review in any way, if you're giving free product, if you're sending swag, if you're, you know, a coupon, if there's something you're giving to people in order for them to write a review, then it's technically an endorsement. You're incentivizing it. And, you know, I, as a consumer reading your review might perceive it differently if I know you got free product in exchange for it, even if you could have written something horrible and it still would have been posted. It's just, it's, changes how, how someone might perceive the review. So if you're giving, if you're incentivizing reviews in any way, that needs to be disclosed uh, in those reviews. And I guess that's my my one thing to, to know as you look at that space, you know, make sure your star counts are accurate, that you're not withholding back reviews. You know, if you're holding back low reviews, so you can contact people and try to fix them. That's also potentially an issue. You know, I mean, you could do it for a very brief period of time, but if you end up holding back all these reviews and kind of altering the star count, that that's an issue too. Um, but, but I'll Jack, Jack, that. Jack, 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 yep. that's not just for this industry. That's across no. the board. Sorry, I mean, no, people yeah, need to no, know that. Yeah, that's across the board. So let's talk specifically. Bill, you and I had a conversation about continuity and customer acquisition and auto renew. A little bit on the legal side, but more so in terms of the consumer and in terms of processing payments. Is continuity going to happen in this industry? Are we going to see upsells, auto renew? How, do, how does that fit in? Uh, I think you will see it, um, and it's not going to happen right away. Um, I've seen merchants try to push that past our underwriters today, and it's not that our underwriters don't like it at our payment processing companies. It's the banks that don't like the fallout from it on the uh, you know the elevating liability associated with refunds and chargebacks right so you know and if the bank says no then we have to say no so i think with time and proven results and you know good best practices of managing merchants um, that that will improve right um, we also look at um, all the reviews and stuff online as well right well, and we see things we ask questions right you know, this, you know, this product isn't going to cure cancer. It's not going to cure arthritis, but it's certainly going to help, like even my own 87 year old father, right? Um, I rub some THC CBD oil on his, you know, his bursitis in his shoulder. Guess what? My mother tells everybody he's cured, right? Um, and that he's on the weed now, right? That's what she says. <laughs> I'm like, no, no, mom, he's not on the weed, right? Here's what it actually <laughs> physically does. Um, um, and it and it does work, right? Um, but but there's going to be all kinds of people out there that are never going to give it its day, right? Um, and I'm not going to be one of them, right? I'm going to be in Anthony's box. I'm going to say, yeah, try it, right? Don't be a naysayer, okay? Um, and if it works, be truthful about it, okay? So to Jack's point on reviews, yeah, you know, um, you know, it, it's like what we did 10 or 15 years ago um, when people were, you know, like when Blue Stuff advertised that their cream um, cured arthritis, right? You can't say that. There's no cure for arthritis. Did it make it better? Possibly, right? Um, and that's what CBD and THC-based products are doing for some people. So, and, and in terms of auto renew and continuity, so you know, in my mind, and I know this is crazy, and, and Sully's going to laugh at me, but you know, with all of what's happening in, in direct marketing with with subscription boxes. Like yep. I can I can see I can see a, a weed box coming in the future. I can see it. I can. Maybe I'm wrong, but you know, we, at some uh, point in time, we would want that to happen. But subscriptions and auto renew and continuity. So Sully or Jack, do you want have anything you want to from a legal perspective, a marketing perspective? Um, Is that coming? I, I I can jump in. We we love subscribers. We offer subscription. What what we have to be careful of, and luckily there's some fantastic software platforms out there right now that actually let Bill subscribe on an individual level to what he needs. The whole 30 day, 60 day, 90 day really doesn't work. It, 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 that was the older model. Now we can get down on a, a granular level of Laurie. How much are you going to take? What do you need? And it's awesome. Now, I have much smarter people than me working for me who are figuring out, okay, Bill is a high vo high volume user. He, he is going to go through two bottles a month. We can give Bill exactly what he needs. And we know Laurie uses it twice a week. So she, we don't want to fill your medicine cabinet up with the, all of a sudden you cancel your subscription. So what we try and do, and Amazon help with this, I think it's everyone's right now to free two-day shipping. It's a constitution, should be written into the constitution. Everyone gets free two-day shipping with everything. So 
We are all over shipping, which I like. We fulfill in-house for the time being just because it, it's easier. You know, when I can, I put I put personal sign notes in personally with my with this pen, uh, this particular the, the pen that I like, and I write a note, dear Laurie, thanks for you know thanks for making the purchase. We know you've got a choice, and and I sign it, Sully, and I try and make it personal. And I reach out to our customers. I get cell phone, I get notifications on my phone when a customer orders, and I sometimes will text a new customer same day and say, hey, Laurie, saw you ordered, thanks. And in doing that, we start to get this accumulation of five-star reviews. And we get it because ultimately, the customer experience is everything, right? It's everything. Everything. It is everything. Product, you ship a crappy product. It comes in a crappy box. They can't find the 800 number. It comes late. They get overcharged. It's all about the customer experience. And if we, we get people who call up and say, hey, this tastes terrible, you know, and we said, well, it's supposed to taste terrible. It's the taste you hate twice a day. Um, in, in one of ours, it's so strong. And, and we either, you know, we give people a refund or we will make it right. I make it right with every single customer. Now, admittedly, as we grow, that's going to become more and more of a challenge. But it, it is all about making sure that that customer has a great experience and, and, and exactly. nurturing, you know, turning a one-star review into a five-star review. How do you do that? You call them. Hey, you know, you gave us a one-star review. What can we do to make it better? Is it a price point? Did it come bad? Did you not get the design? Did it not work the way you wanted? Can we give you a refund? So we work on that level. Um, just because I bootstrapped it in DR, you know, I used to sell mops out of the back of my van. So I know the value of, of taking care of that customer. And I don't know if we'll be able to do that, you know, as we scale. But I, you know, I watch our reviews like a hawk. Um, and if we get a bad one, we're reaching out to them. Good for you, as you should, and and everyone knows. I mean, it takes seven touch points. It takes retargeting. It takes emails. It's it's all about the omni-channel experience. But more than anything, it's the customer experience, the user experience, and, and that's what's going to make any industry be successful. I, I want to thank. I'd like thank to, I'd like to interject for a second, um, Anthony. We just had some success over the last two months. Um, so very recent with our banks because we're working with them and explaining things to them, right? And we just got a subscription approved for CBD, right? Awesome. Um, and we just got uh, about three weeks ago, we just started to get Delta 8, Delta 9, Delta 10 approved, right? Which is synthetic cannabis, right? And I couldn't do that six months ago. No way. I didn't want to do it. So, so a lot of education, a lot of work going on. Yep. Um, so I'm on my soapbox. Um, I'm at, you know, so it's been off. Well, I want to, I want to thank the three of you. I have one last question, and this is the, the, the essence of what we're doing. So with tobacco and with alcohol, I need the three of you to give just a one sentence, two sentences. Is cannabis CBD recession proof? Sully? Well, I don't think we've been through a recession since we've since we've been in the market. But if we're going into a recession, I would say it does fall in the purchase of it. I believe that when people are in recession, we're in a we're in a difficult headspace. And I believe because of the either medicinal or recreational benefits, I would probably venture to guess that sales will go up in a recession. I think. So Good to know. Say Bill, recession. what do you say? Uh, do I'm going to side with that or something that you said earlier, the 30 to 60 year old crowd is who's pushing it, right? And it's just the tip of that crowd, you know, the tip of the iceberg in that crowd. So they're gonna keep testing it, telling their friends, and their friends are gonna keep dumping the fuel on the fire. So I'm gonna agree with Anthony, it's gonna go up. Wow, Jack, what do you say? I'm gonna, I'm gonna hedge like any good lawyer. Um, the <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, a lot of the problems we're talking about stem from the fact that there isn't a body of clinical testing yet to support, you know, the pain relief claims that we want to make in advertising. And that's why, you know, the traditional advertisers are pushing back on improving that. Um, so, you know, if that clinical testing develops, which I think everyone is constant is confident that it will, then, yeah, I think it's recession proof. You know, it's going to be a staple and the for consumers everywhere. But, you know, if that yeah, I guess so. My one caveat would be if that clinical testing doesn't pan out, that doesn't happen, and you know those pain relief claims never get fully lawful, then you know that'd be a huge stumbling block. Got it. So as we're wrapping up this portion of the webinar, um, thank you, 
Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mike. Thank you. You guys are great. John Yarrington, uh, there probably are many questions from the audience that you want these three insightful, brilliant men to, to answer. So please take it away, John. Great, thanks so much. Here's a, here's a great question for you guys to kick this off with. Beyond government regulation, there seems to be a plethora of corporate restrictions when marketing cannabis and CBD. Of the big media outlets like Facebook, YouTube, and even all the cable networks, is there a progressive thinking platform that's leading the sales and marketing charge for these products? Um, I can talk a little bit to that. Um, no, I don't think there is. I think the traditional broadcasters are way behind the the, the, the lawyers. I, I put this on the lawyers. I think the, the sales guys would love to do it, but the, the legal departments in these companies are saying no. Very similar to processing. Facebook is, is I don't want to say this, you'll probably get blackballed on Facebook, but Facebook's just as bad. There's one agency that has a monopoly and they must know someone at Facebook that has all of the CBD marketing on Facebook goes through this one agency, which to me is very monopolistic. Um, so no, I, I don't think there is anyone leading the charge. And if, if anyone, you know, if anyone's listening on any of those, well, we would love to spend money with you. Like I would like to spend money with your network if you will let me spend it. And it is very, very frustrating. So that's a hard no, John. Thanks, Anthony. Bill or Jack, any thoughts? Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to agree with Anthony on that one too. Uh, I, I don't see anybody pushing that agenda. So um, obviously they have the command of the eyeballs. Um, I wish it would open up. Um, it would certainly add fuel to the fire, um, but it's locked down right now. And I'm not sure what the fear is, and why, why it is locked down. So. Appreciate the feedback. Thank you. Uh, Bill, this is actually a question for you directly as the payment processing expert on the panel here. Does mm -hmm. Visa MasterCard not take charges for CBD at all, or was that for only cannabis? Uh, no, CBD is allowed to go down the normal rails of Visa and MasterCard. Um, the Farm Bill did that um, when that was legalized. So, um, so it is only for THC-based products, over 0.03% THC content. Bill, I'll jump in there if I can from first-hand experience of this. Um, QuickBooks refused to do our payroll because we were CBD based, which this was a, a, over a year ago. So we had to move off QuickBooks for payroll and Bank of America shut our bank account down with it with a month uh, notice. This is a major bank and we're not even in the THC business. So it, we've had, you know, it is, we have found financial institutions to do it, but it's it's been hard. I mean, when, you know, if your bank calls you and says, oh, uh, we're closing your bank account down in a month, and you, yeah. you can't pay anyone. It was un unbelievable, you know, but it, that happened and we navigated it. Well, that's good. You should call me. We could have helped you out right away. I, um, I, now I know you, uh, but, uh, that, that, you know, it, at the time, you know, it's difficult. We, it, was, it was tough. Yeah. We've had to, uh, John, to further on that question, we've had to become students, not just of payment processing, but of banking. Right, and we've had to we've had to learn where uh, partnerships come into play and to trust those partnerships. There's 18,000 banks in North America, give or take. Right, there's about 2,000 that will tell you they touch cannabis dollars. Okay, the reality is there's about 250 that will bank cannabis dollars, THC dollars. Right, um, and uh, that's not right. <laughs> um, the banks don't know what they're asking. The auditors don't know what to ask the banks. Right. The FDIC is, is, is confused um, because of the FUD that's in the marketplace, um, and everybody points the finger at each other. I've been in the meetings in Washington. They're frustrating, right? And uh, that has to clear up, right? Hopefully, safe banking and those other bills that are chugging along and crashing into walls, they'll get through, right? But, <laughs> you know, uh, everybody likes to talk, especially around 420, that they're going to launch a new bill. I'm talking to you, Chuck Schumer, right? He doesn't need to launch a new bill. There's already two floating around, right? They could just clean them up and put them through. So it's a mess. Great insight, guys. Thank you so much. Here's another question for you. As CBD and cannabis become mainstream, do you believe these products will replace traditional medications? And if so, do you know a big pharma is embracing CBD and cannabis right now? Mm, I can add some insight. Uh, big pharma is on the sidelines but they're making strategic investments here and there, right? They will get in, and right? It's not time for them to get in yet. 
Again, uh, it's about 10 years old, this industry, give or take, the legal side of it, I should say. It's ancient for you know the overall industry. But I'm not seeing um, Big Pharma jump in on giant um, inputs of uh, private equity um, and or infusions, right? Not yet. Um, my guess is when they decide to, um, it will be an additive form, right? To enhance medication. I don't think it's gonna replace medication overall, I think it's going to enhance medication, right? And, you know, I have, I have, like Anthony has with his daughter's story, I have my own story, right? Um, you know, I have my father's story. My wife puts it on her knees from, you know, she's a marathoner. We're not getting any younger in the Ranta household. Um, it works for her. She told all of her sisters, they're all marathoners. Now they're putting it on their knees. And guess what? The aches and the pains go away, okay? So, I wouldn't call that placebo. <laughs> I will call that definitive proof because when you really peel the onion back on it and what it actually does, the cannabinoid and how it interacts with the white blood cell and, and, it, and it speeds healing to a damaged tissue area or a damaged area of your body, it all makes sense, right, to an educated person. So, you know, I've become a little bit of a student of it because it's a vertical that I want to help. Um, but, uh, you know, to me, I think it's going to be It'll be a boondoggle for the pharmaceutical companies, and they have the muscle and the power and the money to make that happen. But I'm not seeing them in on it yet. Um, in Thanks. a nutshell, there's one FDA-approved anti-seizure CBD-derived or hemp-derived medication. I believe it's on the market. I'm not going to say the brand of it. I think there's anecdotal evidence everywhere that, you know, this works in in various ailments in various with various people so i would say unleash the studies unleash the medical community to study this plant and come up with the studies the double blind studies the placebo i'm not a scientist or a doctor and, and study 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 it and then you can bet the big pharmaceutical industries will, will jump on this if there's an opportunity they, they there's too much money in it for them not to but there's a lot of money in keeping it down and and complicating it so my conspiracy theorist is, is, you know, they're running around doing laps around uh, Congress trying to stop any meaningful because they, they like us, you know, slamming ibuprofen and slamming whatever else it is that they can make money off. And God forbid this little plant that comes out of the ground might be able to help millions of people. Um, you know, I'm sure there's an army of people in a little room somewhere trying to figure this out. And when they do, it won't surprise me if one of the big pharma, you know, they managed to make vaccines very, very quickly when they realize there's a lot of money in it. So I, I think. I think it's it's coming. Um, you know, the the funny thing is some of the biggest people that are against this, you know, that are vocal against it, probably go home and, and sparking up when they get home. <laughs> you know, the the thou doth protest too much are probably the ones that use it after a crappy day in Congress or going home and getting probably lighting up at a joint. It's so it's all coming. It's just going to take time. Um, and I, I will. I would love the day when you could walk into a, a pharmacy and get a, you know, uh, our product. Uh, we, you know, we can't even put our tincture on the shelf at Walmart because it's it's unknown. So more studies, more universities, more students, more people, more you know, more studies on this so that it can be legitimized and it isn't you know living in the shadows. Awesome feedback, guys. Thanks so much. Jack, I think this one is a, a good one for you. Can you legally retarget visitors from a cannabis scent dispensary, or is that a state by state specific? Legally retarget, like you know, like reading cookies and. I'm assuming it would be like someone visits your dispensary and then you retarget them with future marketing opportunities. I mean, nothing about that sounds legal to me. I guess we would need to get in the weeds on it a little more. I would say definitely consult your <laughs> consult your lawyer on that one. But so yeah, sorry to have kind of a nothing answer there. But you know, on its face, that seems you know I I don't think the privacy laws, for example, are you know they're they're not specifically addressing uh, you know cannabis and CBD use. You know, they're not looking at that specific subsect of a of a you know sales area. Thanks, Jack. Appreciate that. Guys, this is for anyone, but I think, Bill, it might be a little bit more in your arena. It seems like cannabis industry is dominated by large organizations with a lot of private funding. Do you know smaller, do you, do you think smaller operations will gain access to federally insured banks and financing in the near future? Um, yeah, I don't think that there's a barrier for the smaller entities. 
Um, I think it has to do with knowledge and the drive to get to those entities, right? Um, again, there's a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, there's a lot of bad things that have happened to good people in the cannabis space. Um, those stories spread like wild, wildfire, and then they retract, right? And they're like, well, well, I can't go to a bank. I have to go to a, uh, a money facility or, you know, I've heard all kinds of crazy stories um, that, you know, they'll take and they'll process my money at the Fed, right? But they're paying 50 or $60,000 a month in order to do that. Does that make any sense? <laughs> Not to me, right? It sounds like they're getting fleeced um, mm -hmm. and that they need different forms of payment um, and different people to handle their business affairs associated with their companies, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and again, I talked about, you know, I'm passionate about this kind of stuff um, because I'm tired of seeing them lose their money. Um, and this is just another way that it happens. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the banks are stuck in a spot because the auditors don't know what to ask the banks. The banks are afraid to make a mistake because the fines are real, right? So they need to pass some rules to let them breathe and then let them understand so they can crawl, walk, run, right? Um, it's unfair for, you know, the government to allow states to legalize cannabis um, and then <laughs> um, banks to operate within that realm and then uh, not understand the rules and regulations when there are no rules and regulations associated with what they're doing. Some of it's pioneer stuff, <laughs> left and right. So how can that be fair? That's really good feedback, Bill. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more question. And Anthony, I think this one falls kind of in your court. Is there an 800 pound gorilla which exit uh, exists within the CBD and THC marketplace? And if so, do, do any of these big companies do a great job marketing multiple product lines or creating brand extensions with the products? There are, um, I'm not going to mention, I would like to be the 800 pound gorilla in the CBD space. I'll just go on the record there and you can hold me to that. We are, we were, I was late in, I was not the first, I would say there was the first round of people in. Um, I will give a shout out to a, a competitor. I mean, Charlotte's Web was very inspirational to me and uh, little Charlotte, who's no longer on this planet, was was a one day, you know, as, as history, not one day now, um, you know, that company led the way, the Stanley brothers, and you know, I'm very, very grateful to what, what they've done. And I, I think that they're in the same boat on a bigger scale of, of I, you know, I've never talked with those guys. We, we deal with a couple of, of the big players in the space. Um, but I, I don't think there isn't, an, there isn't, if you want to talk of an 800 pound gorilla in terms of like, I would say OxyClean in the laundry space is an 800 pound gorilla. Um, there are a couple in there, obviously, Arm & Hammer is one. There is not really in this space, like I said, I went back to the beginning, full circle. If you go in and ask Betsy in Omaha, who, who I believe is, is sometimes in the, in the DR shopping space, tell me a brand of CBD, they, they don't know. Um, that there isn't one. Now, we all know, Jack, you know, Bill, you know, you're in the space, you know you're processing for. But if you go out to an average person on the street, go into a 7-Eleven and ask anyone, What's this, get, tell me a CBD brand, they won't know. Oh, so wow. I think that there is not an 800 pound gorilla in the room. I most certainly want Mark Cush <clears> to be <throat> one, and it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a fist fight. Um, and that's what makes it exciting, is the fact that this is still an emerging market. I think for the people in it, we've been in it, and we're like, this is a mature business. Why can't we get this? Why can't we get, we, we are still, it, this, we're still, we haven't even got out of kindergarten yet on the, on the, you know, where this is going. We're not even in high school, but it's our company, certainly. Um, so um, I, I hope that we can get together as an industry, you know, and, 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 push and lobby for, for growth and for sustainability and for wellness profitability and the greater good. So I want to be one of those 800 pound gorillas. I'd love to see that happen, my friend. I'd love nothing more than that to happen come true. Well, guys, I'm going to jump back in here because we're up on our hour now. I'm going to close out. So here I come. Yay. Lori, Anthony, Jack, Bill, what a fantastic session. So much amazing insight. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your experience today. Folks, I hope you enjoyed today's conversation as much as I did. Before we close out, I'd like to take a moment to invite each and every one of you to join us for our next PDMI webinar, which is the PDMI Take 20, hosted Wednesday, April 27th at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. We'll be discussing frictions and audience measurements. 
I'd also like to remind that you that the fall PDMI conference is now open and ready for registration. You can visit thepdmi.com, that's thepdmi.com to get your badges. And the, that event will take place October 24th to 26th in San Diego at the Hard Rock Hotel. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. Again, Bill, Anthony, Lori, Jack, awesome job. Thanks so much, everybody, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Jack. Happy 420. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone.